Good morning, and here we are again, as we have been for the last however many weeks, a moment of reflection, just to pause, to come together as a church community and say, what do we think God is saying to us this week? Now, some of you have been asking about getting back to church, and um, we've all heard the sort of the idea that the weekend of the 4th, the 5th, of July it might be the time when churches are allowed to open and and hopefully hopefully that'll be the case and certainly that's what we're working towards but we've got not got anything concrete yet and one of the points that has been made by Elim just this week is that we are going to have to make sure that we can dot all the I's and cross all the T's so we will let you know as soon as possible what we're going to do and how we're going to do it or what we're going to be able to do but hopefully we'll be able to come together in actuality again very soon. Of course, church is available if you want to go in, as some people have done this week when staring at the same four walls has made them go, I want to be somewhere else to pray. Uh, some people have gone into church for prayer this week, and if you want to do that, then you're more than welcome to do it. There are some indicators there's a whiteboard there with some sort of rules protocols about cleaning and so on and staying far apart and all that sort of thing one of the things that we do need to do is make sure that we don't have too many people in church at the same time so if you are planning to go it really is essential it's not just the kind of please do this it really is essential so that we can make sure we are managing things properly and being responsible it's essential that you send us a text maybe text linda because uh, i'm back at work next week so text linda and just let her know when you plan to go in if you haven't got a t number to text then drop us an email chesterton elim at outlook.com chesterton elim at outlook.com drop us an email and let us know but by all means do take the opportunity just to be able to go somewhere else and pray and get away from those walls because sometimes they do feel as though they're closing in don't they let's pray we thank you today lord that you are with us when the walls feel as though they're closing in when life feels as though it's pressuring us we thank you that you are with us and indeed that Lord Jesus, one of the things that you have taught us is that our relationship with God is not a relationship of a servant. In fact, it's not even just the relationship of a friend. You taught us our relationship when you taught us how to pray, and you started it by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven. We thank you, Lord, that you are our Father. We thank you that that is the commitment that you make to us. And we thank you that that is the security that we can stand on. Help us to grasp that. Help us to live it so that others might see it. In Jesus' name, amen. And there is, of course, a certain inevitability at the moment I clicked record this morning for them to, this to record this, that the rain would start. Apparently it's going to be a shower it's a long shower, that's all I can say. Anyway, we will press on nonetheless because it is Father's Day. I mean, that's the thought for today. And so I was thinking about the image of God as Father. It's a very powerful image throughout the Bible, God as Father, isn't it? Especially perhaps in an age where more than any previous generation, the reality of absentee fathers has had an impact on how Young men view themselves, young women view themselves, how families view themselves, and so on. And finding the way forward in that for an awful lot of people can be really difficult, which is why the fact that God not only says, I am here as an example of fatherhood, which is important, <clears throat> is, he doesn't just give himself, set himself up as a teaching aid, as it were. He actually goes a step further. He says, I would be a father to the fatherless. I would care for those who are lacking that role in their lives. None of our parents were perfect. None of us as parents were perfect. Some were better than others. But it doesn't matter how good or how bad your parents were. There's always an area where perhaps they let us down, uh, where they fell short, where they didn't match up to what, exactly what we needed. And the truth is that God recognizing that says and commits of himself i would be that area of lack for you i would be that point that that satisfaction of that need that supplying 
of those answers, that providing of that healing and that wholeness and that, that roundedness that you need. I would be that for you if you would let me because God wants to be our father and not just father but also dad he puts a spirit in us he says that enables us to call him Abba daddy dad it's that intimacy that closeness that God is my dad and he wants me to understand that and you don't see that image more powerfully I think anywhere in the Bible than in the parable of the prodigal son where we have this image of God as Father, who allows us to develop as a person, doesn't restrict our development, even though that takes us into places where we make mistakes. He recognizes that he can't tell us everything we need to do. We need to learn it, and sometimes we will make mistakes. But the, the dad in the parable of the prodigal son, he doesn't hold his son back. He, he says, if that's really what you want to do, if that's the path you really want to follow, then follow that path. And even though it takes him down a road where he stuffs up, he loses everything, his life is miserable as a consequence, when he then comes to himself, and that's the key thing, you see, he came to himself. He came to the point of understanding himself. And when he got there and he came to that point of understanding, he had a look around and he thought, I'll go home. I'll go home. And when I got to thinking about this story and thinking about it and reflecting on that parable, I thought, why did he go home? What was it made him want to go home? And I don't think I've ever heard, in all the sermons I've preached on this and all the, the sermons I've heard on this, I don't think I've ever heard anybody reference the servants in the story. We talk about the dad, we talk about the older brother, we talk about the prodigal son. We don't often talk about the servants in the story. And yet it was the father's treatment of them and their example of living out that f relationship they had with the, his father that made him think, I will go home. You can read the whole parable in Luke chapter 15, but just a couple of verses. Verse 17 says this, When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Ah, oh, it's brilliant, isn't it? And it's this wonderful image of God when we come back to him, when we come to ourselves, when people come to the realization that they need God. This wonderful image of God watching out for us and ready to run down the road and meet us and embrace us and have compassion on us. And it's tremendous. God is our Father. But I got to thinking about the servants and the fact that their example was what inspired him to go home to his dad's. And that got me thinking about a question I heard a long time ago. I mean, a long, long time ago. It's based on Luke 11, verse 23, which says, Whoever is not with me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters and the question i heard a preacher pose was are you a gatherer or a scatterer because it's interesting that there is no halfway house with this there is no neutral ground in that statement luke 11 verse 23 if you're not with me you're against me and if you do not gather with me you scatter there's no neutral place it's one thing or the other. If there is no positive movement, there is a negative impact. And that is actually the case through the whole experience of our life as Christians. If we are not positively moving forward in God, there is a negative impact on our living, our experience, our closeness, our intimacy, our example, our witness, etc. All those things. The Christian life is a journey. It's a life of movement. Our relationship with God is a journey, it's a movement, and if it's not moving forward, it's going to have a negative impact. <clears throat> and years ago I heard this question, are you a gatherer or a scatterer? And of course, our immediate reaction is to go, oh, well, obviously, I'm a gatherer, Paul, I'm a gatherer. We need to be careful with that, though, don't we? Because we can't assume that. The person I heard preach the sermon 
that said, are you a gatherer or a scatter? A sermon which had an impact on me and, uh, you know, stayed with me all these years. A few years later, he suffered what they euphemistically call a moral lapse. Left his wife, left church work, all of that sort of stuff, yeah? Sometimes when we hear questions like this, so we hear this thought of, where am I as a Christian? Our immediate response is to go, oh, I would never do that. It's a bit like Peter, you know. I will never deny you, Lord. Yeah. <sighs> Take heed when you think you stand, lest you fall, the Bible says. Sometimes we just need to be willing to reassess our lives and ask ourselves, is there a danger that I will fall into a different way? But are you a gatherer? Or are you a scatterer? And that's the question I'd like us just to reflect on a little bit this morning, if you don't mind. Because the servants, you see, they were gatherers. The life they lived, the life that they had in the father's house, inspired the son, appealed to the son, showed a better way to the son. And as a result, he went home. In Romans 11, verses 13 and 14, Paul says, this is how I'm going to live my life. I am going to live my life so overtly in God, so obviously full of the things of God, so full of the reality of God. I am going to live my life in God to such an extent that people will see it and they will be jealous that I might save some. So am I a gatherer or am I a scatterer? There is no halfway house. And it's not just about good example. It's more active than that. It's not just about going, here is a good example which you can or can't follow as you choose. It's more drawing people in because of how we live. Revealing a depth because of how we live. Because if we are not drawing people in, if we are not showing that which makes people go, wow that is so much better than what i have just now that is so much fuller than what i have just now that is so much more secure than what i have just now if we are not causing prompting that reaction in people then at best they will stay where they are which is possibly not a good place and at worst they will go elsewhere to try and find answers when god is waiting for them simply to come home so he can run down the road to meet them and I've got to think about this in, in three areas. First of all, do our words gather or scatter? The way that you speak, the things that we say, the attitudes that we reveal through our lips. In this time where there is an abundance of negative words, do our words make people go, wow, they are well fed. I'm going to go to the father's house. I was listening this week to Christine Kane. She was talking about uh, the children of Israel in the wilderness and 40 years wandering around Sinai. And she made the point that part of what kept them there were their grumbling negative words that did not express faith in God. And an interesting sort of sidebar, if you like, was where she said, our words can keep us in the desert. Our words can keep us going round and round the same mountain and never getting to move forward. And there's truth in that, isn't there? So do our words gather or scatter? Do your words gather or scatter? Do they make people go, wow, they are well fed. I will go to the Father's house. Secondly, does our outlook gather or scatter? In this time of fear, in this time of anxiety, and I know I've said this a lot over the last few weeks, but it's it's really powerful opportunity that we need to grasp. Does our trust in God and our confidence that he holds the future as we, to quote the old hymn, cling to the old rugged cross, Does our outlook, our perspective, the attitude we have to life, 
do people see it and go they're well fed I think I'll go to the father's house thirdly do our actions gather or scatter how we show kindness how we show integrity how we show selflessness does it gather or scatter I mean when you have a conversation with someone do you spend more time talking about your problems about or asking about theirs I mean the truth is we all need to share our problems and I'm not for a moment suggesting that we shouldn't or that we can't we should and we can but there's a difference isn't there between sharing our problems and being determined that everybody will know our problems rather than having an ear to hear theirs selflessness in how we deal with life and deal with other people's needs actually gathers or scatters and our kindness our integrity our generosity gathers or scatters and I want to take a moment to say thank you to everybody who has contributed to our agape appeals over the last few weeks because of your generosity I mean in truth the room that I'm in right now it does look a bit like a warehouse <laughs> of food and stuff but your generosity in that has meant that people who for whatever reason can't access the food bank but who are in real need we've been able to show God's love to them the spirit of our agape basket that Edith started all those years ago actually made manifest in this time of real need and um, and thank you for that because you see our kindness our integrity our generosity our selflessness our actions the things that we do gather or scatter people see them and the question is do they see them and like the prodigal son do they go they are well fed I will go to the father's house people today need to be in the father's house the good nature of the father and how that was lived out in the servants inspired the son in his place of need to say they are well fed I will go to the father's house let's pray Lord you are a good God you are a good good father we thank you for what we have in you we thank you for your commitment to meet every need in our lives and to make our lives rich and full we thank you that when we saw the example in other people of their experience of you we were given the opportunity to realize they are well fed and to come to the father's house help us to be gatherers not scatterers in that same way to live lives that reveal the richness that comes of having you as our father and to inspire people to go to the father's house cause us to reflect on that thought Lord to be willing to ask honestly in our words in our outlook and in our actions are we gatherers or scatterers do people look at what we manifest and say they are richly fed I will go to the father's house help us to live that sort of life we pray in Jesus name amen and before I go as I have referenced that phrase the father's house several times it's only fair I think that I recommend a song to you do a search for the father's house by Corey Asprey fascinating lyrics powerful imagery and a wonderful truth